So I want to just dive in and start creating a function. I think the best way to learn Lambda is really just to dive in and play with it. We'll get to see some of the things that are kind of weird about it so that you don't get confused when you're trying to do this yourself. I'm going to start in a UI here and we'll just create a function here. Now, of course, there's a bunch of options, of course, like with anything in AWS. So you can use a blueprint and a blueprint is really more than we want to do here, right? It's just trying to hook up a bunch of services to Lambda because there's a lot of things in AWS that can trigger an invocation of a Lambda function, like sending logs to it or something like that. We're going to do author from scratch so that we can start simple and just get a feel for how this works. Now, there's a lot of run times here, right? So we have custom run times, other supported ones like Node.js, Python, blah, 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 and of latest ones. So uh, .NET, Golang, Java, Node.js, Python, Ruby. Notice that these are the officially supported ones, but you can actually do some fancy stuff later to create your own custom run times like adding in PHP. We are going to start with a Golang one, and I'm also going to show you a Node.js one later as well. We're going to start with a Golang function here. And we're just going to call it foo func. And so I know it's a going one. I'll just go in this case. The architecture, I'm going to do um, x86-64 versus an ARM-based one, although you can really do either. You can really do either because it's serverless, so you don't need to care. But it does affect how you compile your code if your code is compiled. So in Golang here, I would have to compile it specifically for ARM64 if I chose that option. I'm going to do good old x86-64, and then we can continue on. So a default execution role. So this goes back to IAM permissions. If you've seen the course on IAM permissions, this might make sense to you. What an execution role is, is just the permissions the function has when it's executing. So what it needs for bare minimum permissions is to actually write logs to the CloudWatch log service. In your AWS account, nothing has permission to do anything without you explicitly giving permission to do it. So this just can't write logs to your CloudWatch uh, service just because it's in your AWS account. It actually has permission to do that. To do that, we create a role. It's called an execution role in this case because it's giving the Lambda function permission to do something when that function executes. So it's at least going to have permission to write to the CloudWatch logs, which it needs in order for us to debug and just see what's going on when we invoke a Lambda function. I don't have an existing role. I'm going to have it create a new one. And we can see it's going to create a new one called foo function go role and some random string. Great. So we're going to let it create that, and it's going to give permission to upload logs to CloudWatch, like it says there. Advanced settings. I'm not going to do code signing or the network. The network is interesting. If you need your Lambda function to talk to other services over a private network, like your databases or Elasticache or something like that, you can choose that. This does slow down your function a little bit if you choose that. But if you need it, then you know go ahead and use it because you need it to talk over a private network. A lot of times this is unchecked so that you get the speed benefit. It's faster when it doesn't have to connect to a VPC whenever you invoke a function. But then as a result, your databases and caches and all that stuff have to have more open uh, security rules where you are allowing them to be connected to over a public network, essentially, because it's not within a VPC here. It's not within a private network. Let's go ahead and create this function. And that function is created. OK, so what else did this do? If we go to security credentials, and then I'm also going to open up CloudWatch. It hasn't done anything in CloudWatch yet, but it will within CloudWatch when we run a function. If we can go to logs and go log groups. This will be empty right now, but once we run a function, it'll create a log group automatically, and the log output of invoking a Lambda function will appear there. Now within our security credentials here, we'll head to roles. We'll see the role that it created, foo function go, blah, blah, blah. This role has a policy attached to it, and that policy allows this to create a log group and then write to that log group by creating a log stream and putting log events into it. So this is going to allow that Lambda function to write to CloudWatch to create a log group, to create a log stream within that log group, and within a log stream to put events, which is just lines of a log. So those are the things that got created in the UI when we created a function here. OK, so we have a Lambda function here. It has an ARN, a resource identifier. We can test it. Now, this is a Golang environment, so I actually don't have a code editor here. But if it was not Golang, like if it was Python or Node.js, we actually would have a code editor here, and we can actually edit it right in the console, which is kind of neat. You can test it, right? You can send some data to this function and invoke it from here. Monitoring is similar to the dashboard we saw before, except this monitoring is specific to this one function. Configuration, so how big is it and all that good stuff. What triggers this function? So what events in AWS might trigger this, like uh, an HTTP request to API Gateway, or a new event, a new message inside of an SQS queue, something like that. The permissions that I just saw, that I just showed you, the role it uses. 
and all sorts of other stuff, right? If it connects to a BBC, if it uh, is tagged, environment variables so that you can have some secrets in here that you might need, and all sorts of other configurations that we can play with later. Aliases, you can alias a function and call it other ways, and there's versions. So every time you update the code in the Lambda function, you get a version, so you can call specific versions if you'd like. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually write a really quick little Golang program here, a little function that we can upload to this and run. Over here in my Cloud Class directory, I'm gonna make a Lambda intro folder. We'll CD into Lambda intro. And even within this, we're gonna make a function foo go. Because we'll do a few functions. I'll do a Node.js one, later I'll even do a PHP one. So we're gonna start with a Golang one. And then we can do some Go stuff to kick this off. So go mod init foo function go. This is all standard Golang stuff. If you're not familiar with Golang, do not worry about it. It doesn't matter too much for the purpose of this video. I'm just gonna show you different examples. Um, and in here, we're going to do one dependency. I'm going to get a dependency here from the AWS official packages here, um, AWS Lambda Go slash Lambda. And then we can go ahead and actually edit and create a quick Golang program here. It'll be very small. So main.go is what I'll call it. And well, what do you even put in here? I'm just going to go ahead and show you. That's a little better here. So we have package main import uh, FMT format, and we're importing the Lambda library that we included here. We have a struct that's going to be turned into JSON. So we have my event here. This is going to be the incoming data um, when we call the function. It's going to get converted to, or it's going to be read as a JSON object, and it's going to be marshaled or unmarshaled into this object. So we're going to get a JSON string, Golang, and the Lambda program behind the scenes is going to convert that to a, an object here based off of the keys in the JSON object. So the JSON object that we're going to send this function is going to have a name and a message. And then it's going to return a response. The response is just going to have an answer uh, object inside of that JSON. And in our case, we actually create a my response object, and then that gets converted into JSON behind the scenes and sent back as the response of this function. So we have a my event struct, which is an object, and a my response object struct here. It just basically represents JSON going back and forth into this function. The function is going to get this event, so it's going to get some JSON, uh, the Lambda code here that AWS provides is going to convert that into our object here, our my event object. And then we return a my response object and that gets converted back to JSON as the response. So the handle lambda event function is really the main thing here. It's the meat of this function. It gets the event data and it returns a response or an error if an error um, was found. And in this case, our response is just, here's your message and it returns the name and the message as part of that, right? So hello name, here is your message and it returns the message. Now we have the func main here that's required by Golang in your package main, um, as this is the main thing that gets run. It runs the main function when it starts the Golang program, and this main function is just calling lambda start and it's saying run this function, the handle lambda event function, which is defined right here. Okay, nothing too fancy there. How do we get this up into our Lambda function over here? Well, we do a few things. For Golang, we need to compile it, which means a call to the go build command, except we need to build this for in a Linux machine, right? I'm on a Macintosh here. We need to compile the Golang binary here for Linux on AMD 64, right? Not ARM 64. So we're going to build it for AMD 64 for the Linux platform. And we're just going to say we're going to build the main.go program, which is going to give us an output of a program called main. So if I list this out, we see the program called main exists. I can call it here, but it's going to break. It's not going to work because this was compiled for Linux, not for a Macintosh. Okay, so how do we get this function up into Lambda over here? Well, we just basically, the simplest way, there's a few ways, but the simplest way is to create a zip file. So I'm gonna zip this function up. We'll call it main.zip, and I just want the main function inside there. Golang is nice and easy because it compiles into a single binary. Everything, your entire program compiles to a single binary, which means the only thing we have to upload to Lambda is that one file for the most part. That's not always true, but it's mostly true for Golang apps. So we'll zip it up. And then we can do a few things here. First and foremost, let's actually make sure our function exists here. We'll do an API call to Lambda. The API call is get function, and the function name is foo func go, right? It exists here. We'll just get some information about that. And it gives us some JSON response, right? And it just says that this exists. This is the ARN, that's the runtime, all that good stuff. You may have noticed over here that we have a handler called hello. Hello is actually incorrect. This handler should be the file name. The file name we gave it is main. We're gonna upload a file named main. So instead of hello, we're gonna update that handler to be main. And then we should be good to go to upload this. So we can upload here directly. I'm gonna do it from the command line here. 
And what we're going to do here is call update function code. That's part of the Lambda service. So the function name, the foo func go, right? So we're going to update the foo func go function here with a zip file that's in the local location in this current directory main.zip. And this B is not a typo. So file B slash slash main.zip. Main.zip is the function we created here, right? And we're going to tell it to publish this. So we're not just going to upload this version. It's also going to become the latest version that is used and published within the uh, Lambda function. I think the opposite of that is no publish, something like that. It's basically a Boolean flag. So this is uploading. It does take a second, right? It's not always super quick. OK, so that is uploaded. We can see we have some information about it, like the code size and all that good stuff. Let's go ahead and refresh this page over here. And we'll see that we have a version here, right? A new version, version 6. Now, it's version 6 because this function actually used to exist in my account already when I was testing ahead of creating this video. Otherwise, it would be version 1. If we actually go up a level to functions, we'll see it's 4.2 megabytes in size because the Golang binary was that size. We can click into it. And we could actually go ahead and test it if we wanted to. We could send this data to it. But I'm going to do that over here from the command line once again. So what does it look like to call a function here? So we're going to do lambda, right? the lambda service, and invoke. We're just going to say invoke the function. The function name, of course, is foo func go. Invocation type is request response, right? So we have different invocation types. This could be an asynchronous invocation type, in which case it doesn't wait around for the function to finish. It just invokes it, and it does what it does. In our case, we're going to say request response. We're going to wait for the response and get the response back here. CLI binary format, raw in base 64 out. This is just what we need to do if we're actually going to pass in a payload of a JSON string, which in our case, what we're going to do. This is basically just backwards compatibility for uh, an older version of the AWS CLI. And we're just using it here because we're going to pass in a payload that is a JSON string. Otherwise, this would give us an error. Now, the result of the function is going to get spit out to a file named output.json in the current directory. So let's go ahead and call this. We'll see if we get an error or not. OK, so status 200, execution latest. This would have some extra information if we got an error. So we did not get an error. That's great. And if you do get an error when you're testing this out, you'll actually get the error in the output.json file as well. So we're going to cat output.json and just see what's in there. And we get our answer, right? The JSON that was answered in that function. So the answer is, hi, Chris. Here's your message. People like you. Oh, how nice. OK, so what just happened here, we invoked a function, right? So if we go to monitor, we should shortly see some data here about that invocation. Um, it's not instant, right? So we might need to wait a second. While we're waiting for that, we can head over to CloudWatch. I'll refresh this. And now we have a log group. So the foo function go log group was created in the AWS Lambda namespace. The slash AWS slash Lambda slash whatever is what you should do if you're creating a log group manually. Oftentimes, if you're defining this in an infrastructure as code using Terraform or CloudFormation or anything like that, you will make these ahead of time. In this case, I just created it. The reason why you might want to make a log group ahead of time is because it defaults to never expire, and you may want to actually have that expire. You should have your logs expire in CloudWatch because they cost you more as they accrue over time. For our case, our demonstration here, we're just going to let the function create the log group itself, and I'll just delete these after these videos are done. So we'll go to the log group. Within the log group is a log stream, and within the log stream is some logs. And we have some logs related to our invocation of the function here. And they don't really say much. It just says it starts, it ended. And this is a report on what happened within that function. Its build duration is 2 milliseconds. The environment size was 512 megabytes, all that good stuff. This was a cold start, so it initialized within 76 milliseconds. And I should point out to you that Lambda functions have a notion of a cold start. So a Lambda function can run, and it'll handle multiple requests. And then at some point, that Lambda function will uh, be removed and replaced with another one when it gets the next request. But we have this notion of a cold start where a Lambda function will have to boot up for the first time, and that's a cold start. And that's often longer than subsequent ones, because after a cold start, the Lambda function is running and waiting for new requests. So a Lambda function, its little environment can get spun up, and it'll stay alive for a certain amount of time. That's not something we control. The Lambda code behind the scenes, the Lambda service, decides how long that uh, function lasts for. And the first time it starts, it's cold and it's slower, right? It has to build the micro VM, the micro virtual machine that the Lambda environment is built in, put your code in, run it, and all that good stuff, and that takes some time. After that, there's no longer the cold start time. It's running, it's up and running, and just handles events as they come into the Lambda function. So the init duration might be lower on subsequent invocations. OK, back here, we have some data finally. Invocations, just one. The duration was you know, one low, low amount of milliseconds. No errors in our case. 
And none of this matters because we really just ran this once. This stuff all matters when you actually have an active Lambda function that's actually getting used a bunch. So just a quick review, we created a Lambda function. We made a Golang runtime. We created some Golang code. And that Golang code was super basic. It was just a function here. And that function took an event and did some processing. In our case, all it did was return a response. And that's basically all a Lambda function is. It's just a little function that handles stuff. Now, later we'll get fancier with this. You can see a little bit more of what it looks like to have a web app as a function or even multiple functions. But for now, this is really just the concept of what a Lambda is. It does some work. It runs this in a serverless fashion. In other words, you don't have to care about the server or anything. It completes and it reports back on the result. And you can see what happened through the CloudWatch logs that result from the Lambda function. If I um, logged any data out into this function, that would end up here as well, right? Anything that gets echoed out to standard out or standard error will end up in CloudWatch as well. And in our case, when we invoked it, we did the request response invocation types. We waited for the response and therefore we got the JSON back here. If we called it asynchronously, then it wouldn't do that. It wouldn't, we wouldn't have gotten the response. It would have just run the function and then it would have just run. We wouldn't have any response from it. 